Uh, good afternoon. I uh, Welcome to the Utah State University Center for Women and Gender webinar series, bringing you thought leaders and trailblazers throughout women and gender studies. So I am Melissa Keller. I'm the senior staff assistant here in the Center for Women and Gender. For the format today, it'll be a 35 to 45 minute presentation. We'll do questions at the end. There's a little box to the right of your screen where you can type in any questions that you have and we'll get to as many as we can within our time limitations. So today we're excited to bring to you Rounding the Bases, a Sex Positive Approach to Violence Present Prevention, a presentation by Dr. Jennifer Smith, Jonathan Grove, Angie Hambrick, and Jennifer Warwick. Jennifer is the director of Pacific Lutheran University Women's Center, as well as an affiliate faculty member in the Women's and Gender Studies program. Her research interests include transgender studies, queer and feminist theory, and British literature, and she regularly teaches courses in gender, sexuality and culture, women's studies, and feminist and gender theory. Jonathan Grove is the men's project coordinator at the Pacific Lutheran University Women's Center, where he leads violence prevention and men's engagement efforts. Involved in survivor support, engaging men, and prevention since 2003, Jonathan now invests in sharing his knowledge and experience to support such efforts around the country through his writing and speaking. Angie has been director of Pacific Lutheran University Diversity Center since 2005. Her areas of professional interest include social justice education, microaggressions, and ally development, and she is currently pursuing her PhD in higher education from Azusa Pacific University. I hope I said that right. Jennifer is the administrator of the Voices Against Violence program at Pacific Lutheran University, where she oversees victim advocacy services and violence prevention programming. Jennifer also has expertise in women's empowerment and vicarious trauma, regularly presenting on these topics in academic and clinical settings. I will now turn the time over to our presenters. Thanks. Okay, guys, I'm going to make these guys the presenter. Hello. Um, ready? We can hear you. You bet. Go ahead. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us for our webinar today, uh, Rounding the Bases. We're just going to jump right in so that we're able to cover all of the information um, in the time allotted. And those are our pictures, again, if you want to put a face with the voice. Um, we'll do our best to announce ourselves as we're speaking so that you know who's speaking at any given point in time, although I'm assuming you'll know who Jonathan is when he speaks. So <laughs> you never know, though. Um, so first off, we start with this question, what's your roster? And this is something that we asked ourselves as we began exploring integrating sex positive um, information into our violence prevention programs. And some questions you might consider asking yourself in order to test the climate on your campus would be, does your campus pretend that students aren't having sex outside of assaults? Is there any programming around consent? Is it all yes or all no? Um, is your programming proactive or is it reactive? And that's one that we found to be really helpful in examining what we offer and what we could uh, supplement. And is sexual, sexual health only the responsibility of our health center or is it a collaborative effort across the campus? So a little context of who we are, um, who uh, we are as Pacific Lutheran University. We are, as you can see, we are a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And what that means for us is that we, um, Lutheran is our middle name, but what Lutheran means to us is really about asking questions. It's about inquiry. It's about vocation. And it's about calling. So when we think about ourselves as a Lutheran institution, we're thinking about ourselves um, in the context of how we fit in Lutheran higher education. As you can see from our demographic information, and this might be you know, familiar to you all at your current institutions, it's kind of like the, the traditional student is now the non-traditional student, right? So traditionally, males were the, um, the students that we saw in our institution. And as you can see here at PLU and probably at your institution as well, um, the majority of our students are female. Another interesting fact for us here at PLU is that we are, we consider ourselves a residential campus, but 52% of our undergraduate students live off campus or commute. And so we see, as we were thinking about some of our programs, we were really thinking about how do we make sure that we connect with students who leave the campus at five o'clock um, at night. And so how are we intentional about making sure that they know about our programs? Um, we are 23% students of color. And here that includes students who self-identify as black, Latino, 
Native American, Pacific Islander, Asian, multiracial, and also other. I think our incoming class of first year students for 2013 was over 25% students of color. Um, and again, you can see that 22% um, of students consider themselves as Lutheran. And while we do have and continue to have a, um, a, a true connection to uh, Lutheranism, um, Lutheranism, I'm going to say that, made that up, um, a lot of our, the majority of our students and the majority of the people who work here do not consider themselves as Lutheran. Um, so another thing that we thought about as we're thinking about PLU in um, our demographic context, we also wanted to assess kind of who our students were, um, who they think they are and who we know they are in a sense. So our students would say that they are globally focused. Um, I think our uh, number is over 40% of our students study away um, at least one time in their um, time here at PLU. And study away can be a domestic program or an international program. So they definitely say that they think about themselves um, in, in a global community. They would say that they are active leaders and they are leaders inside of PLU, so traditional clubs and organizations um, and student government. But they are also would say that they're very active outside of PLU in the community. So a lot of our students that we see have um, a great connection and affinity for the Boys and Girls Club, for instance. And so they will say that they are leaders, not only here at PLU, but also out in the community. They would say that they are socially focused, that they are knowledgeable, that they are curious, <laughs> and that they are open-minded. So they are, they want to know more about multiple perspectives and what that means. So as we were building our program, it was uh, really important for us to assess um, who our students said they are um, as we were crafting the different programs that we offered. So this is Jennifer Smith again, um, and I failed to mention at this beginning that you'll notice we tried to maintain the baseball theme throughout our presentation, um, but when that failed to work, we'll just refer to sex. So um, hopefully you'll enjoy the levity of some of these um, titles. So calling the pitch, what are we talking about? Um, I want to briefly note first that there was a bit of a discussion on the women's studies listserv regarding how we're using the term sex positive and I wanted to clarify for those of you who are interested exactly how we define that term and how we see it. Um, we are aware of the historical meaning of sex positive, it being a term that those who oppose the anti-porn feminists applied to themselves in the 80s. Um, and in some respects, we agree that it can be reductive and a bumper sticker slogan, I'm not necessarily denying that. Um, it can be really simplistic, but unfortunately that slogan works in terms of attracting students' eye and catching their eye initially, um, but we are fully aware of kind of how it's utilized in that particular sense and the limitations of using that, um, unfortunately. But that being said, uh, the meaning for us is different within the context of violence prevention programming and connotes a more proactive stance around this educational endeavor versus reactive. And so that mirrors the CDC's call um, that was articulated in a public health approach for advancing sexual health in the United States, um, in which they outlined a more positive health-based approach to addressing sexual behavior across the lifespan. And then that then started to bleed into organizations at the national and state level who do work in violence prevention, as you can see in the second two bulletins there, just you know, a few examples of what we're seeing in the field. Um, also, I would say that sex positive resonates very differently with our students outside of its historical meaning, and Jonathan will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and that's not to say that it doesn't carry the connotation of its initial meaning, um, but at least for our audience and intent, our programming is structured around their understanding of the term so as to advance a more holistic approach to sexual health and violence prevention, um, sort of meeting them where they're at, if you will. To expand on this just a bit further, we like this quote from the Chronicle of Higher Ed, which appeared uh, last year, I want to say it was last summer, um, because it's one that can resonate with administrators who may be hesitant, or as I would say, squirrely, uh, to address the complexity and reality of students' sexual behaviors. Um, and it provides a holistic model for approaching our students' behaviors and their attitudes. Um, and while this is an individual approach, yes, um, we do our best to contextualize the information presented in our programming within a socio-cultural framework um, while recognizing that emphasis on the individual resonates with most students. And it's a balancing act as most practices often is, um, but our overall intent is to remove shame from the equation of sexuality and sexual behavior. 
So this is Jennifer Warwick. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we decided to approach um, sex positive programming on our campus. Um, we were lucky that as we were considering this program several um, years ago, we started in 2010, um, there was some national dialogue emerging about best practices for sexuality programming, um, along with the recommendations from the Chronicle of Higher Ed that Jen Smith re or re referenced. Um, we were affirmed that we were on the right track with the way we were approaching it, um, being sure that we highlight um, considerations of student safety and privacy, offering multiple perspectives, having administrative um, sponsorship and control, and making sure students are connected to campus resources. Um, you'll see on the slide the questions that we consider when we're developing our sex positive series in order for it to be appropriate and relevant and responsible and inclusive. Um, the first one is who's sponsoring the education? Is it an outside organization that comes in? Is it students? Um, we feel that having administration sponsor um, in collaboration with other student groups or outside organizations allows there to be a, a campus connection, um, as well as vetting um, for people who are experts and have a solid foundation in the field. Um, and figuring out whether we are providing an educational programming or entertainment. Um, for example, we have had um, groups come in and talk about sex toys, and while that can be a very fascinating or titillating um, presentation, if you will, um, without conversations around sexual health and consent, um, it's more on the entertainment end and isn't providing students with the context that they need to safely and consensually engage in sex toy use. Um, thinking about funding partnerships um, can lead to unlikely opportunities. Um, and different campus connections and resources. And we'll talk when we um, highlight some of the programs we did about the different connections that we had um, that were really beneficial. And then thinking about the hot topics and trends. And again, we'll touch on this a little bit more. Um, one thing that we might be considering is um, what's happening with students online. And what are some of the discussions that they're having on Facebook or in private chats around um, sex? There's actually a page called Lutes Confess that we're hoping to draw some um, topics from where students can anonymously post sex questions and have each other answer um, without any sort of guidance or expertise there. And so we're hoping to kind of use the conversations they have to inform um, what we're addressing. So sorry, I just started running my mouth earlier and didn't introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Angie. I was the one who was talking about uh, kind of the PLU context. So this is me again, um, talking about pillow talk meets throttle gonorrhea. So as Jennifer and uh, Jennifer share with you all kind of some of the, the national context and what was going on to uh, show that there was a need for these the conversations, we had a couple needs ourselves. So here at POU, there were a couple of STI, and we put outbreaks in quotations, um, because a lot of it was rumors and miseducation about kind of what was going on. So there was a rumor on campus that um, rhodogonorrhea or gonorrhea of the throat was going around and it was highly contagious. And we also had another rumor of what our uh, health center director has called immaculate chlamydia, which <laughs> meant that um, students weren't talking about how they might have contracted STIs. They weren't being honest with themselves, they weren't being honest with their partners, and they weren't being honest with the healthcare provider to get um, the treatment that they needed. And so all these rumors are kind of swirling around, and some of it has some truth, but are swirling around on our campus and nobody's having a conversation um, with our students about kind of what these rumors mean and what um, happens to these types of relationships. So that was a definite need that we saw. Another that kind of goes to what um, my two colleagues were also talking about were um, the, co the positive conversations concerning sex, gender, and sexuality. So we know that when our, for instance, when our first year students come on campus, um, they get, you know, 20 to 30 minute orientations about um, kind of how to, how to behave on campus around issues of um, sexual harassment, um, sexual assault, might be a little Title IX thrown in there, might be a little EEO policy thrown in there, but they weren't getting real intentional um, content about um, gender, sex, and sexuality. So we definitely saw that there was a need for that as well. 
Uh, this is Jennifer Smith again. Um, to uh, dovetail off of what Angie was saying, we also wanted to provide some programming to help counter the hypersexualized cultural climate in which all of our students exist. Um, and this is where that sort of danger of the tagline or bumper sticker sex positive can be uh, particularly potent. So a lot of the things that some students would see as sex positive were actually a really commodified version of sexuality. And so we wanted to introduce the idea of sex, sex as a process and sexuality mm -hmm. identity, sexual identity as a process into the conversation and that we emphasize that through all of our programming. And so really um, uh, hitting on, if you will, um, sex as a process and not a thing to be obtained. Um, and also to balance out campus programs related to sexual violence, which Jennifer Warwick will speak a bit more about now. So this is Jennifer Warwick again, and I'm going to talk about the history of our violence prevention programs at PLU. Um, like many universities, we've done um, violence prevention work for a while in different forms, um, but it's been formalized here on our campus since we got Department of Justice funding through a campus grant in 2005 um, and have had this funding until um, currently, um, and we will be institutionalized in the next um, academic year, which is very exciting, and our programs will continue um, as is. Um, we've been recognized as a model by the U.S. Attorney General for our violence prevention programming. Um, particularly for our men's engagement work and for our peer education programs. Um, the focus on, of our programs are on victim advocacy, as well as first responder training, um, education for incoming students. As Angie mentioned, we've really bulked that up this year to provide a larger understanding of um, the expectations around sexuality and behavior, um, as well as the role of alcohol and bystander behavior before students even come to campus. Um, and then our peer education program follows up on that um, with workshops throughout the year on consent and healthy relationships. Um, we do the Green Dot Bystander Training, and Jonathan will talk in a moment about men's engagement work. Um, this Department of Justice grant has really formalized partnerships with campus departments and community agencies to provide the aforementioned services. Um, and the Six Positive has really um, help build upon that conversation, and I'll revisit how it's enhanced violence prevention work um, in a little bit. Hi, everyone. This is Jonathan. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, sort of about the history of, of our grant project, <clears throat> this will be sort of an overview of, of how we started in terms of engaging them. <clears throat> um, as you see at the top there, the focus was really on just sort of basic education, getting guys involved. Um, and, and doing some education and prevention work. So um, initially it was very much about using sort of the, the men against violence model. You see a uh, note there about Lilo Hong's work um, around men against violence groups um, as, as well as, as um, doing some of the prevention work that was to a broader uh, population um, as well as the, uh, providing some information. We'll come back to this in a little bit, but maybe to plant a seed, um, just want to highlight that the, the name of this project at, the, at that point was Men Against Violence, and I think that's an important point to come back to in a bit. Um, also, one last thing is in 2010, we had a conference called, uh, it was our second conference called Paving a Rocky Road that was really focused on uh, reducing the barriers to men's engagement and helping to streamline sort of their uh, allyship and activism ultimately, um, which I'll come back to in a bit. So you all can, oh, this is Angie. Uh, <laughs> as you all have heard, there was a lot of information and context that really went into us creating uh, our sex positive uh, program. So um, thinking about what Voices Against Violence offer, thinking about the men's project, thinking about kind of the context of our university, our, who our students are, the national scene, all this went into creating our five um, learning objectives for the program. Um, and when we were creating them, all, all that context we kept in mind, but we were really thinking about if our students say that they are X, let's affirm that, but also um, let us also kind of uh, push them towards their learning edge and help them to see what their learning edge is around um, what they say they are and their identities that they avow. And we can do that with this program. So for instance, um, being empowered to make voluntary and responsible sexual decisions. If our students are telling us and believe that they are active leaders, then they really need to be active in this process of making decisions for themselves um, around um, whether or not they want to have sex, who they have sex with, and what does sex look like and how um, they identify sex. 
Um, another one, uh, for instance, recognize myths and stereotypes about sexual behaviors. If our students are saying that they are socially conscious, um, then what are, what are their learning edges around kind of what they know and how do they um, perpetuate and buy into different myths and stereotypes about sexual behavior and how do we um, help them to see that learning edge? It's Jennifer Warwick again. Um, we're going to jump in and talk about the programming that we've done and this is a overview of the topics we've covered thus far over the past three years, three and a half years. Um, the first year, which is the first four programs that you see there, um, were the topics were selected by the staff who were in the program. Um, then after that, we relied on student feedback um, and requests and suggestions um, for the future programs. Um, we're gonna jump in and talk about a couple of them to highlight some of the collaborations and um, topics in a little more detail. And Angie's gonna talk first about how we, we went about promoting the programs. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that uh, the program was had a brand and we worked. What's so great about our program is that students are so involved in the process of um, helping us to find speakers, moderating uh, uh, and facilitating the different panels and really giving us their feedback on topics that they want to see that it was really important that they were also part of the branding process. And so we worked um, and still are working with a student designer um, to create the brand. And as you can see, our posters are dynamic. Um, students, when they see the colors and the logo, they, they instantly know that it's a sex positive event. Um, and that has really helped us to uh, solidify the program. Um, in the beginning, um, we uh, kind of framed the topics around popular songs, or at least songs that we thought were popular. <laughs> um, like, you know, Song Pepper, Let's Talk About Sex. And we had um, a, a sex positive panel on virginity. So it was, you know, like a virgin. And that's kind of sort of, we thought it were popular songs, but the students really didn't know. So we wanted to make sure that, yes, this is educational and you're going to get so much out of this experience, but we're all, also, there's a little bit of fun that goes along with it. And so our branding um, kind of communicates that to students. This is Jonathan again. As uh, Jennifer mentioned, as kind of laying out some of the topics that have been covered, the very first uh, program, <clears throat> um, part of that was about eliciting sort of responses from students about what, what do they think sex positive means um, and sort of establishing some of the things that needed to be responsible. On the two. Um, and that really set the tone for topics to come. Um, so that it really was the topics were grounded in the student understanding and also the areas where they felt like they might need some, uh, some further education. So um, the program that we did two years ago, um, with Philosophers Between the Sheets, is unique in the sense that the philosophy department actually sought us out to create this program. Um, and they did so because they were trying to develop their program and assist with recruiting students to the major. Uh, um, they were having a hard time kind of convincing students that uh, philosophy was one relevant and two sexy and so they came to us to help build a program around a course that was already being taught was just which was philosophy 239 philosophy of sex and love and the person who actually taught this course um, professor Hannah Love was actually one of the panelists on the previous program that Jonathan referred to let's talk about sex what is sex positive so she used her expertise to help help them to find what sex positive is um, so for Philosophers Between the Sheets, we use students from that course, as well as uh, Professor Love, to create a kind of um, panel discussion debate over sexual rela sexual related uh, conundrums that were in uh, the Savage Love column, which is the column out of Seattle written by Dan Savage. So one of the um, uh, questions or situations that was, was examined was about whether or not um, in engaging in sexual activity on a second life was a form of adultery and so they uh, they examined that particular question from a variety of philosophical perspectives. Some of the objectives of this program was not only to serve the need of the faculty members but also to think about uh, rooting sex and sexuality in academic disciplines and specifically and explicitly engaging the moral and ethical dimensions of uh, sexual behavior as noted in that previous slide from the Chronicle of Higher Ed um, and also to promote the discipline of philosophy in general this program was really exciting because it was interactive. We used clickers for it as well. So students who are in the audience could provide their particular perspective on how one solves or addresses the conundrums that were 
presented in the scenarios, um, but also in the sense that it engaged students in um, really complex ways of thinking about sex outside of uh, the act itself. This is Jennifer Warwick again. I'm going to talk about another program. This is one that we do yearly at the end of the year. It's um, a Q&A session with experts, um, both from our community, the PLU Health Center, as well as our, our bigger community, um, including the Center for Sex Positive Culture in Seattle. Um, so we draw upon you know, campus experts as well as outsiders to come in and um, answer anonymous questions that students submit ahead of time online, um, as well as questions that they ask freely or um, write during the session. Um, and it's a, it's a free-for-all ask. They can ask whatever they want, and they do. They ask about a lot of things, so the topic <laughs> is always um, different. Um, the purpose of it is really to debunk a lot of the myths that students have, or misconceptions about sex and their bodies and intimacy, and give them um, some tools and some conversation around um, how to be healthy and um, sex positive. Um, these questions in the conversations that occur um, help inform future programs. You know, if they're talking a lot about um, virginity or about, you know, for example, orgasms, we may decide to have a program the following year that really highlights that in more depth. This is Angie. So, um, as Jennifer just mentioned, that you know, the the Sexy Back program, um, we get a lot of feedback from that program, and we can craft future programs around some of the topics that come up. And uh, BDSM kind of was one of those topics that kept occurring over and over and over again, either in the Sexy Back program or in other programs where we asked for feedback um, and did evaluations and asked students what they wanted to see as their next panel. And BDSM always came up. So we, uh, we did it. Um, and the great thing about this program was that it really was about the myths and the stereotypes. So students had a stereotype of who they thought lived a kinky life. They were expecting, you know, someone to come in on the panel who was in leather and who had neat thigh-high boots and brought her whip, which she kind of did. Um, but there was also someone on the panel who was just in jeans and a sweatshirt. And so it really challenged our students to think about who do they stereotype as living a quote unquote kinky life and what does this person look like? And with all of our sex positive programs, what we've, what it really boils down to is that you need to communicate with your partner, with your partners, with yourself, and even with yourself thinking about um, for yourself, um, what do you want out of a sexual relationship and what does that look like for you and how are you able to really communicate that with other people? So those four programs were just a sampling of our sex positive buffet, if you will. Um, but uh, we do have an assessment tool that we utilize to see if we're on the right track. And as you can tell from the slide, it is very basic. Um, it kind of gets at sort of the heart of are we doing it well? If not, what can we do better? Um, and while it is basic, it does provide us with access to qualitative as well as quantitative information about how well the programs are working um, to examine um, the effects of the program on campus long term. We're entering our fourth year with the program and so um, creating an assessment tool that helps us measure the long-term impact of the program and whether it helps whether it has helped to create a culture shift on campus is sort of where we're at at this particular stage from students in the past regarding the sex positive program. And I would say that the first one's probably the most significant um, and uh, speaks to many students' reactions to positive programs that less the final sentiment, sentiment in the first statement that it had caused, her to ref, caused him or her to reflect on um, personal opinions and beliefs gets at the heart of what we want them to get out of the sex positive programs um, and to think about how they can help to complicate their perspective and perhaps to shift them down the road in addition to hopefully altering their sexual behavior so, as it, so that it's as satisfying and healthy as possible. 
This is Jennifer Warwick again, and I'm going to talk for the next two slides about how the Sex Positive Program has enhanced our violence prevention programming. Um, and I say enhanced, and we call it friends with benefits, if you will, because um, it's not replacing the need to talk about social or political structures that um, perpetuate violence and oppress women, mm -hmm. but it enhances the conversation to um, enable our students to take that information and put it into the, the praxis of their lives where they can think about their relationships and their behaviors um, and, you know, and put that into practice. So, first of all, um, prior to VAV programming, and this was prior to 2005 when we got our Department of Justice grant, the focus was on awareness events, you know, the Take Back the Night, um, clothesline project events, which are fantastic and which we still do, um, but that challenged rape myths and victim blaming culture. Um, it was fragmented because there was no centralized structure. It was very reactive to events on campus, and it was um, driven by student organizations and sort of the student whim. And if that wasn't there, then it didn't necessarily happen. So the Voices Against Violence um, provided a program and funding in order to make these more sustainable and continuing. Um, and assessment shows that um, it did. And over the course of this um, past eight years, our campus is much better about talking about sexual violence on campus, accepting um, as we know it's difficult, but that it does happen on our campus, but allowing us to accept it and then be proactive about it um, through innovative programming and innovative services to students. Um, our peer education program is a good example of this. Um, while it does include um, debunking myths and looking at rape culture, it also has expanded to have workshops around healthy relationships, gender and sexuality, um, healthy masculinity, and enthusiastic consent. Um, so it allows our peer educators to take some of the conversations that are happening in the sex positive programs and really work with students on a smaller scale within their residence halls or in classrooms to have them examine what their relationships or what their um, sexual relationships may look like for them individually. Um, so it meets students where they're at. Um, and it's also helped shift um, violence to a more, or violence prevention to a more holistic student-centered and empowerment focused um, type of work. Um, let's move to the next slide, okay. So this is um, particularly talking about how the sex positive has impact our survivor support on campus. Um, and it's done so in a number of ways that we found really um, successful. And this is stuff that I hear and see from the students that I serve as the victim advocate on campus. Um, we feel that the goals of the sex positive programs um, and the structure and the content are very in line with the healing process. We feel that um, the traditional messaging for victims um, that has been deemed helpful and is helpful to an extent, such as um, rape is about power, not about sex, um, the idea that it's not your fault and that you can still be a virgin, are all very accurate and important things for victims to hear. But it can also leave victims wondering, you know, why is sex so shameful or so difficult for me still? Um, so it allows them to. Um, engage in a program where they don't have to identify as a victim. It's not about victimization, it's about healthy sexuality. And so they can enter um, sort of with a, a new lens. Um, it enables them to re-examine their thoughts about sex and intimacy and redefine boundaries that may have been missed. Um, we don't see it as a replacement to counseling, but it's definitely a springboard to further services if needed because we are connected, um, the programming for Sex Positive is connected very closely with different campus services. Um, and we feel that it um, is a safe environment and we really take precautions to make sure that um, the conversations are respectful and um, private and um, supportive and empowering. Hi, this is Jonathan again. Um, <clears throat> kind of taking off of what Jennifer was talking about in terms of um, moving away from this sort of, um, in terms of responding to violence and sort of the setup where it's, uh, you know, we approach folks as either victims or perpetrators. Um, particularly beginning around our prevention work, we started moving into the bystander model, which, you know, it approaches everybody as part of, as part of the solution and not um, necessarily a victim or perpetrator and sort of um, refocuses people around building community. Um, we sort of built on that idea um, as the men's projects took form. And I mentioned earlier, prior to this, we had this men against violence model. Um, and coming out of, of this uh, 2010 conference, we were really focused on well, what are we asking guys um, to do around, how, how are we asking them to understand their masculinity in, in positive ways? Um, so if we have this sort of against model, 
which defines uh, a lot of things, but specifically we're talking about masculinity um, in a negative way. What do we have to offer um, that that is positive to give that sort of positive sense of self um, to give them a clear role um, and what we kept coming up with was the sense of brotherhood was something that guys were responding to regularly. Um, and, and particularly I'm talking about here, not the guys who show up to the, the men's group meeting because we put out a flyer that we're having a bunch of guys get together and talk about masculinity and feminism at the women's center. Um, that historically has been a very small group. But we were really, I was trying to get at how do we get the, the majority of men to get involved in this? Um, the other sort of caveat here is that this was also envisioned as a beginning point uh, in a process that would eventually lead to sort of that the choir, if you will, um, that come to those very specific meetings, but to move kind of beyond that. Um, just really quickly, the three aspects that we use around that are, um, <clears throat> are the no speak show that you see there. No is really about language, so being able to identify what this positive masculinity looks like. Um, Speak is about sort of passing that information along and also sort of re, um, reifying that information for themselves or that understanding. And then show is to just demonstrate it, whether people are there or not. The picture that you see there is sort of an example. Uh, it's from a Mother's Day brunch uh, that we do every year um, at our local domestic violence shelter. Um, and these, these are guys that I recruit that are definitely not the choir. Um, they're, in that picture, there's uh, a couple of football players. There's the star basketball player that year. Um, some guys that are sort of leaders in a lot of different um, like RA roles and ROTC, some other places. So these are definitely not the choir, but they're coming out to do this work. Um, lastly, uh, we currently we have a Verizon Wireless grant to do some work. So what that entails is we're holding a community forum later this spring um, to bring this conversation to the community and, and really host that. We're bringing in Tony Porter to help us with that. Um, and also to we've got a... Um, a healthy relationships workshop uh, curriculum specifically for guys that we're rolling out this spring as well. So we continue to knock this out the park. We are just grand slamming every single semester with this program. And one of the things that I think makes this program so great, especially for me, speaking personally for me, is that you have two offices, uh, the Diversity Center who traditionally doesn't talk about sex, and then you have a women's center who talks about maybe a certain kind of sex, and you throw us together and we are getting our sex on in a really positive and intentional way, and it's so great. And I think our students are able to see what true collaboration around um, something means, what intentional collaboration means, um, and how working around um, uh, a specific topic that we're both passionate about really has um, great results. Um, another thing that I just want to point out with is that uh, students are engaged and it's excited. Um, we all have to judge our programs by numbers sometimes and we all want to make sure that there are butts in the seats and we get butts in the seats. There, uh, our sex positive programs average between 75 all the way to 250 on uh, any given panel and so um, just by sheer numbers, we know that students um, are really engaged and really want to have these conversations. Oh, quick, oh, our home run or the Grand Slam. Um, so the program has been recognized. Um, I think this is our fourth time um, presenting on the topic um, because it, it's so important and it's so unique and uh, so special. So the playoffs, this is really about sort of, and this is Jonathan again, um, sort of future directions. So um, you see some of the topics that are upcoming here, um, some field trips. Um, we're lucky in that we're not too far from Seattle, and that's the home of Bayland, um, who's in that picture that you see there. Um, also looking toward more interactive programs and activities to go beyond um, maybe some more of the sort of panel style or those kinds of more informational programs and really um, involve the students in that way. Um, continuing to diversify speakers, um, in, in those programs. And then the last is, is sexting kits, um, which that's a longer story, but basically um, there was a typo and there was a, a information sheet sent to students before they came to campus that recommended them bringing sewing kits, but the typo was it said sexting kits. Um, there was an attempt to kind of fix that, but we um, exploited that and handed out <laughs> sexting kits uh, at orientation. So this is Jennifer Warwick and I'm gonna talk 
through the next two slides pretty quickly so we can get to your questions. So start thinking about what you want to know from us. But what we learned are um, knowing our limitations. And know, though we have a lot of people here on campus, we um, draw upon others for the expertise um, and you know, to maintain our time and our sanity. Um, sticking with our learning outcomes as a yardstick to measure programs against. Um, thinking broadly about the campus for support and buy-in, that philosophy panel is a great example of that. And um, that's a great way to have further resources and funding, which can often be tight for many of us. Um, involving students in the process, as you've seen, we rely on the student feedback very much to um, have the discussions that join into the discussions that they're having. Um, including community organizations, both as experts as well as a draw. You know, we can all talk to we're blue in the face about sex, but if we bring in someone new and shiny, they're gonna listen. Um, and then being brave, we started big and we kept it big. And there's no pun intended there, but um, it <laughs> kept it going. And I'm just gonna leave at that. <laughs> I'm going down a bad path here. Um, so here's some questions that we want to um, put in front of you. And we do have a handout that we can probably, you know, upload somewhere um, to have at your disposal. But the, these are things to think about. Um, the little pink dot is sort of where we rate ourselves on these spectrums. Um, but thinking about the positions that you are in, pun intended, um, what's the campus culture like? Are you more conservative, more liberal? Are there certain values that you need to consider? Um, what are the current or past programs that are addressing positive sexuality currently, um, as well as programs that address violence prevention? Um, what are the perceived barriers? Are there any? What are they? Is it administrative support? Um, are you stepping on someone else's toes? You don't know where to start. Um, who are your allies? Is it faculty, community, different student groups? Um, and then what resources or partnerships or funding do you have? Are there grants, um, you know, collaborative opportunities to tap some other people for those resources? Um, these, it's kind of a good spectrum to look at so you know where to put your efforts in. And yeah, we're ready for questions and to keep with our baseball theme, there's Rosie from A League of Our Own, who looks inquisitive. <laughs> All right, that was great. Let's see, um, do we have any questions coming through? We're gonna give everybody a minute to type them in. Okay, Tracy Russell asked, will this recording be made available after the webinar? It will, we actually have a YouTube channel, so you can go on to YouTube and search for women and gender center for women and gender at Utah State University. Um, you can also go to our website, womenandgender.usu.edu. Thank you. Um, Sarah Rimmel, you may have already mentioned this as I came in late. What criticism of the language sex positive exists? Oh, um, that came across in the women's studies listserv and some of the criticism was that it failed to recognize the historical context for the term. Are you guys um, able to hear us? Excuse me? He. Jonathan, are you guys still there? Oh, okay, I will start again. I'm still there, yeah. So the criticism around the term sex positive arose on um, the women's studies listserv that the webinar was advertised on. And um, some of the, the critiques were that it failed to recognize the historical um, uh, birth of the term, if you will, out of the 1980s. Um, some feminists who opposed the anti-porn movement at the time labeled themselves as sex positive, trying to create a dichotomy between sex positive and sex negative feminists. Um, some other critiques included that it was reductive, um, that it was a bumper sticker slogan, um, and that it failed to encapsulate the sort of socio-historical um, realities of uh, sexual violence and oppression. So, um, and you know, to a certain extent, some of those critiques um, are relevant, but we also feel as though, and there was other discussion on the listserv as well, kind of countering some of those concerns related to how the meaning of the term has evolved and how it's used um, in the, within a particular context of violence prevention. It's, and it was an interesting little debate. 
um, actually, and it's not one that I think will soon be resolved. Excuse Great. us, we have a phone going off. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Reed is asking, do you incorporate digital media into your programming? That's a good question. I'm trying to think. Currently, I don't, I can't think of any of the programs that have had any digital media um, beyond the clickers that were used during the Philosophers Between the Sheets program. Um, I think that is as technologically savvy as we've gotten. Um, so we have not incorporated digital media uh, as of yet into the sex positive programming. One of the difficulties with that is the size of students that we draw um, and trying to accommodate that. Luckily for the philosophers between the sheets, we had just enough clickers to accommodate all of the students um, at that particular event. But um, no, that's a, a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Lauren uh, clarified the question and said she was referring to okay. Twitter and sexting. What was the first one? At Twitter and sexting specifically. Oh. No, we have not addressed either one um, in uh, programs just yet. The sexting one has been on our radar, though, um, for a variety of reasons and um, could very well find itself in the 2014-2015 slate of events. So thank Great. you. That's a good suggestion. Uh, Garrett Fiddler asks, can you talk a little bit about your peer education program? How many are there? How do you train them? And what do they do? Um, so there are there are a couple of different peer education programs on our campus. Uh, the one that sort of comes out of, of the Women's Center um, and some of this work um, specifically related, um, it's, we actually just changed the name. Um, it has a longer history as the sexual assault peer education team. Um, as of right now, we've sort of in line with, with this presentation, we've shifted a little bit where it's less about um, sort of the victim perpetrator model and, and really focusing on rape myths um, and sort of trying to win that argument, if you will, <clears throat> which was primarily done in classrooms and to some degree in residence halls. Um, but that model is has, excuse me, has shifted to a four-part um, presentation. So there's specifically a presentation on its gender 101, so um, the basics of sort of the social construction of gender, um, consent, uh, and specifically sort of focused on enthusiastic consent. There's a bystander basics type uh, presentation, and then a healthy relationships uh, workshop uh, presentation that they do. Their training, um, is considerable. We, do, we don't have a way to pay them, so they all volunteer. Um, but it historically has been about uh, 30 hours and has actually gone up with um, sort of this diversification of that. Um, if anybody has specific questions about sort of what that curriculum looks like or those kinds of questions, um, feel free to send, it, uh, send me an email. Um, and I work closely with those students and we can get the, the answers for you. We have currently about 20 students who are peer educators. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Sophia Ondali asks, do you collaborate with other schools to help them set up programs like yours? Um, I'm trying to think if we've had a, we, we presented this topic at the NWSA conference and I think it was the University of Idaho um, had a similar program that they were presenting on as well and so we've kind of exchange resources and chatted uh, after our presentations regarding things that we could share since we're, you know, in the same general region. Um, but as of yet, we haven't outreached to other schools in the area to provide them with resources. We're happy to do that if people ask, um, but we haven't, haven't yet extended ourselves in that, that particular direction. But we're happy to help. Great. Malcolm Astley asks, the language you are using is quite imposing and abstract, even if attempting to be helpful. What specific and concrete problems or trends are you facing and trying to tackle? Well, I think the specific con concrete trends that we're trying to tackle as we've addressed has been sexual violence on campus, um, students engaging in 
poorly conceptualized behaviors um, that have led to um, situations that are regrettable um, on their part or um, harmful as well. Um, and just a general lack of knowledge about sexual behaviors. They think that they know things, but they actually don't. And so uh, I can refer you to some of the previous slides in terms of what gave birth to this particular program related to um, myths and rumors around um, STIs, some of the instances of um, uh, victimization that Jennifer Warwick has seen as victim advocates, um, and then just general conversations with students regarding their, their overall ignorance around sexual behavior and sexual activities. Um, and some of that is outlined in some of the previous slides as well. This is Angie from the D Center. Specifically, the, the Diversity Center is a community space. So there's the couches and the televisions and that sort of thing. And it's a, a hangout drop-in space for students. And I have witnessed students coming into the space and having either really misinformed conversation of conversations about having sex and what is sex or having these conversations and being really embarrassed that they're even talking about it because there's no place on campus or there's no wider and broader conversation where they can feel comfortable thinking about themselves as a sexual being and having sex with more, a partner or more than one partner. And so I think one of the things that Sex Positive does is it, it shatters this myth that you can't even have the conversation about sex um, at this university in a space that's going to be safe for you to ask questions, explore, make mistakes, and also really say that I really like sex or I really don't like sex and making sure that those uh, communities are available for students to have those types of conversations. So yeah, in a nutshell, I would say we're trying to counter violence, ignorance, and shame. To, to maybe give a this is Jonathan to give a, a, a concrete example of kind of how those things come together. Um, you know, in the work that I do around violence prevention, uh, engaging <clears throat> really populations that aren't regularly part of those conversations, sort of where that meets the sex positive conversation is around consent, I think is a great example because going from a no means no, you have to get this um, kind of a scary conversation from the student perspective to a let's talk about enthusiastic consent and how awesome that would be and how, how much better your sex life is going to be as a result of that. So it's a win-win all the way around as, as far as students are concerned, because um, we're actually helping them have better sex, whatever that looks like for them, but it's also in a healthier, safer way for, for them as well as the community around them. So I, I think that's sort of a great uh, concrete example of what that looks like. Great, thank you. Uh, Simone asks, uh, we are a commuter campus and get very few students to participate in our events. Do you have any suggestions? I think we have a good chunk of commuters on our campus, even though we like to say we're residential. And some one thing that we've done over the years is we've moved the time up earlier. So it's almost immediately after the final class schedule um, or the final class offering. And that has helped to increase the number of commuter students that attend our events because they don't feel like they have to go home and then come back for a late night event like at seven or eight. So they, they start at six now. And our last, most of our classes are done at 525 or 530. Um, I think lunchtime programs are a great option. We've not done that yet, um, but I think it's, it's something that we're exploring um, because they're usually there anyway. And for some reason, a lot of our students say that they will eat in their cars, even though there are plenty of places on campus where they can eat. And so that might be a way for them to eat and listen and learn something um, if it's offered during the lunchtime. And if you could provide the food, that would definitely help, I'm sure. Um, but that can also be the ex extensive, but I'm not sure if any of our other colleagues have some ideas. Jennifer does. I have a, I have a thought. Um, this is Jennifer Warwick. Um, I know that sometimes attendance at a community or commuter college events can be smaller than events where we have resident students. And we, we do get a big turnout, like Angie said, and so there's a lot of anonymity there. Um, so ways to keep that um, sort of a safe private conversation if you have, you know, maybe 20 students or, or less um, is through the use of like clickers where people can um, either use the clickers to answer questions anonymously or even there's some polling things that you can use on your cell phone. Um, having anonymous questions asked ahead of time that can be answered within a smaller group um, can really protect the privacy and 
of the students and still get the content and discussion that you want to have. We have a, this is Angie, we have a commuter, uh, two commuter lounges on our campus. And so, um, and we have student leaders, we call them community, community, commuter community assistants. So they are, and they have to uh, create programs, one program a semester. And so sometimes they say that going to sex positive as a commuter lounge is our program for the, the month. Um, and so it, for commuters where they might not feel as connected to the university because they're not in the res hall, they don't necessarily have an RA, that sort of thing. Um, they go as a community um, to one of the events and that has really um, helped connect commuter students to the program. Great, thank you. We have, a, another we have a question from Dawn here. How have your public and campus safety been involved in the development and implementation of these programs? Well, campus safety has been very involved in sort of the violence prevention piece of it in a couple ways. Um, one is we spend a lot of time training them. It is the majority, 90% um, of them are student staff that do the patrol. We only have one um, uh, actual law enforcement officer on campus. And so we spend a lot of time training them to respond appropriately um, and to understand the dynamics of sexual and intimate partner violence based on their role. Um, as for the sex positive side of the programming, we don't do any sort of explicit outreach to them. Um, but I do think that they are attending the programs um, and as students, and but not necessarily through their roles as campus safety officers. Okay, we have another question from Garrett. How useful have you found your culture shift surveys to be engaging the campus climate and measuring success? What has worked well? And is there another research, is there other research you're using to ground your approach as well? Um, we haven't yet conducted our culture shift research yet. We're at the stage where we're beginning to do that. Um, we're going to launch that in the fall of this year because we'll be at the end of our fourth year of the program and have cycled through um, at least a, 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 a section of students. So we've not yet done that particular um, assessment of the program, but we're, we're poised to do that at this point. I'm not sure if that answers the question. And it, I may have misspoke earlier about where we're at in terms of assessment, but that's our next step. Okay, great. I think that's all of the questions that we have. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Again, this has been recorded and it will be posted on a YouTube channel, which you can find on YouTube or via our website womenandgender.usu.edu. Thanks again to Dr. Jennifer Smith, Jonathan Grove, Angie Hambrick, and Jennifer Warwick. Everybody have a Thank great you. Friday and stay warm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.